Hello and welcome to Funk Prog Sweden 9. We are back with another live stream. Um, today we'll have two presentations. Uh, first presentations from Leonardo and the second presentation from Brucho. Let's go to the agenda. So, first a short intro by me uh, and then we get the presentation. Transferring the system modular code base to OCaml by Leonardo Laguna Ruiz. Uh, and then we have Erlang Oddities by Brucio Benavides. Uh, and then in the end I'll do a short, uh, where are we? How many meetings, meetups are left of the year, etc. A schedule and summary of this meetup. First up, we would like to thank our video sponsor, Adabit. Adabit is a small IT consulting company based in Stockholm, Sweden, where most of the developers have a background in functional programming. If you want to know more about Adabit, please check them out in social media or on adabit.com. Uh, and of course, you want to support the Funk Prog Sweden community then what you sh can you do? You can join the Meetup community, of course, and you can subscribe to the Funk Prog Sweden channel. And if you really like Funk Prog the Meetup and the YouTube channel, please head over to and check out the merchandise store where you can get a coffee cup with the Funk Prog Sweden logo type on. If you get any questions during the presentation, uh, please use the YouTube chat and I will read it out to the presenter so they can hear it and everyone else can hear it and you can see it and they can answer it, hopefully. So, uh, with that said, let's get started with the first presentation. Uh, welcome to Funk Prog Sweden, Bruce Leonardo. Hello, hello. Hello, warm welcome. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, you're warm. It's uh, really nice that you can come, and really nice that we find more people that are doing OCaml. So the stage is all yours. Okay, let me start. So, yeah, in this presentation, uh, I'm going to show you our journey into OCaml, and uh, but a little bit about me. So uh, I'm Leonardo Laguna Ruiz. I'm originally from Mexico, and I work at Wolfram. Uh, MathCore, which is a subsidiary of Wolfram Research. And uh, Wolfram MathCore is, is located in Sweden. And we develop uh, uh, the, the modeling uh, part of, uh, of the Wolfram, which is System Modeler. And there's a little bit more about me. So I'm, I'm an electrical engineer. I, I studied a PhD in electrical engineering. And I started programming as, as many of, of people my age. When I was a teenager, I got interested into, into programming. And I, I also like uh, music and synthesizers, specifically DSP. So back in the day when I, when I was a teenager, uh, I was uh, doing C++, assembly for DSPs, and programs for the HP calculator. And at some point in my life, I was working on a project uh, during my PhD thesis, and it was a it was a C sharp project, and I and I needed to to create a, a text box in which the the user could input a formula, and I needed to evaluate that formula. And when I started uh, checking how I could do that in C sharp, uh, so I was looking for a a lexer, a parser and writing some kind of, of evaluator to, to be able to uh, evaluate this expression. And I found uh, this programming language called F-sharp, and there was an example. I, I, unfortunately, unfortunately, I couldn't find the, the exact post, but it was something like this. It was basically what I needed to do. It was writing a, a lexer, a parser, and an evaluator, and everything and the code was super super short and super elegant so it was it was really really interesting for me and that was the point where i got hooked into, into functional programming and following this my evaluator ended up being 
about 100 lines of, of F sharp code. And since then, I, I started uh, programming F sharp. And every project that I, that I had to do, personal or professional, was done in F sharp. So it was like about uh, five years. And during that period, I, I developed a model compiler, a simulator, and an optimization engine, which was all part of my PhD thesis. And also during that time, I, I started learning other, uh, or not, uh, other functional languages like Haskell, Lisp, and OCaml, but I was mainly focused on, on F sharp. Okay, so this is the outline of my presentation. First, I'm going to show you a little bit of the architecture of System Modeler. That way you can, you can have an idea on, on which parts we are doing functional, specifically with OCaml. But in, or, in order to, for you to understand the, this transition, I need to, to explain you the historical context of our code base. And then I'm, I'm going to, to jump into the process that we, that we did to select the, the programming language that we were going to move. And finally, how we, how we move the data, the, the code base into OCaml. So if you, if you haven't heard about System Modeler, it is basically uh, an environment in which you can create uh, multi-domain simulation models. So you have uh, like this GUI where you can just drag and drop components and connect components in order to create complex simulation models. And underneath this system modeler, there is a, a programming language called Modelica, which is a, it's a, it's a domain specific language that simplifies the creation of these models that have on underneath uh, differential equations. And one of the great things about Wolfram System Modeler is that it perfectly integrates with the Wolfram language or Mathematica. And that uh, allows you to do like lots of complex analysis. So some of the applications uh, of, of System Modeler will be uh, this, this modeling simulation of electrical circuits and also combine electrical, hydraulic, uh, mechanical, thermal, bi biological. So basically anything that you can express with differential equations can be, can be mo uh, modeled and simulated with System Modeler. And I also use it for my personal applications, which I, I like to model uh, sound synthesizers. And I have a few blog posts about uh, how, how uh, like the whole process that I do in order to get to go from a, from a circuit to a, a very simple algorithm that can run in real time and you can use for music production. Okay, so this is the, the architecture of System Modeler. It consists of uh, this part, central part that we call the kernel, which is the, the model compiler. It is also a kind of interpreter and it provides all like a bunch of services. And this kernel it communicates with all, all these clients. So our clients will be model center, which is the, the graphical environment in which you create your models. And, you, and when you and you can also do the textual model creation, etc. And then another client that we have is Simulation Center, which is is, is the program where you can uh, control your simulations, uh, plot equations, and do the, the common uh, analysis. And the third client that we have is is the Wolfram language itself, which allows you to do scripting and uh, model creation and also uh, more advanced analysis. And the part that, that we moved to OCaml, it was it was the kernel. The the rest of the, the parts are uh, model the for example model center simulation center and parts of uh, the GUI of the Wolfram language are written in C but the core uh, compiler is is nowadays written in OCaml. But it wasn't always like this. So this is a little bit of the history of. Uh, of System Modeler, it, which it was originally called Math Modelica, and it was uh, created by a company founded around uh, 1998 by uh, Mathcore Engineering based in Linshop in Sweden. 
And they had, uh, uh, around 99, they had an initial version which was written in Mathematica, or now it's called the Wolfram language. But the, the program as we know it, uh, with this uh, model creation, com uh, kernel compiler, etc., cetera, uh, the first version was released in 2006. And another in uh, important point in the history is that Around 2007, another project started, uh, in which, which was uh, started by, by some people uh, from Linshipping University, which, which was also involved into, into MathCore. And it was this uh, Open Modelica, which was basically an open source alternative to what Math Modelica was providing for professional use. And then the next, we, we have around 2000, 2008, um, the company Wolfram Matur was acquired by, uh, sorry, the, the company Matcore was acquired by Wolfram and it became Wolfram Matcore. And this was the year as well when, when I joined the company. In 2011, it was the first, the first uh, year in which we have uh, a release of uh, a Wolfram System Modeler. It was uh, like the rebranded version of it. So basically, okay, this is uh, a little bit about the the development history of the kernel, which is this our compiler. So I, around ninety ninety five, uh, some people from Lynch Open University developed this this language called RML, uh, relational meta language which was a little bit like SML uh, with some, some ex expanded features. And the reason why this is important is this because around 2000, 2005, a new project, a new programming language called Metamodelica was uh, released and that one used the core compiler of uh, RML and also the code generator. And the idea with this Metamodelica uh, language it was to create a language that was like modelica like the language that we use for modeling uh, dynamic systems but extended uh, and turning it into a general purpose language and system modeler and also open modelica the kernel parts were written in this language metamodelica and this language look a little bit like this this is how uh, you will define a type and what i have here is just a, a type, an expression type that can have different representations. It can be a number that has a floating point inside. It can be a variable, which, is, which has a string. And in this case, I have a, an operation, which will be a sum. And we have two, two expressions as uh, inside of it. So Metamodelica had some good parts. And this is what I'm going to show you next. Uh, so basically the types were ML style as, uh, as I showed before. That's the way you, uh, that you define the types. And it had uh, features like pattern matching, uh, first class functions, and it was also portable because it was possible uh, to take uh, the Metamodelica code, turn it into C, and once you have it in uh, a C code, it can be just compiled uh, in any platform that you, that you want. This is how it look. Uh, this is a function. Uh, it, this is an, an evaluator function uh, uh, for the data type that I described before. So we can see that, that I, have, I have to, in, in order to declare a function, you need to type function, and then you need to, to declare every input and every output to, to your function. And then we have this match where we are, are going to to, uh, to to take our, our expression and, and return uh, uh, the internal value. So then we need to declare all the variables that we are going to use locally. And this is our first case. So when we get a number, we just return the floating point value. When we get a sum, we take these two sub nodes here and apply recursively the evaluation function, and then we just sum them and return the value. And something interesting here, so when we, when we get a variable 
uh, we have this other function that is a lookup in, in that is just going to check that name into uh, some table of definitions. And the last case we have it here, because if something fails, for example, the lookup here, if it fails, this, uh, this, this construct that was widely used in Metamodelica called the match continue is, uh, will, will behave as uh, if the lookup fail, it will continue to the next case. And if it matches, it's going to execute that one. In this case, we are going to print an error and then just return a failure that will be propagated to, to the caller of, of, the, of the function. Mm. So, okay, those, those were the good parts. Some of the bad parts. Uh, first one, the language was quite verbose. So, in order to create a function, you need you need to to do uh, I mean to declare everything, declare all, all types, uh, direction of the variables, uh, all the local variables that you were using. And well, then I mean this is verbose compared to most functional languages, right? And the next disadvantage that, that we had is it was the performance. It was not very fast. It didn't execute very fast, and it was also slow to compile. And some of the limitations that it had, it was uh, for, for being a kind of functional language. There were no anonymous functions, no closures, and no if expressions. So if you wanted to do like a list map in a functional style, you will have to create a, another function and then pass all the arguments. Mm, and the process of creating this new function, uh, it was a little bit tedious because you need to type the name of the function, declare all local variables to the matching. So you, you have to do everything. The next disadvantage it was that uh, we had only print debug. So when we when we were trying to find uh, an, an error in, in the in the code, you will add some print statements. Then you recompile, which is a slow process. Then you run and then you find your error. So the next thing that was quite a, a challenge, it was the error handling. And there were also some bugs. Okay, in the case of the error handling, I have this, this small function, which is, it takes an integer number and it outputs an integer. And we're going to jump into this match continue. So if the, the input number is a zero, we're going to execute this function that can fail and then return zero. If the input is it's a number one, we are going to return the number one. And if it is any other any other integer, we are going to print this error that that the input is not zero or one, and and we are going to fail. So, uh, as as in the case that, that I showed before, when we reach this this function that can fail, what's going to happen uh, is is that it's going to jump to the next case and jump to the next case. So for example, I input a, a zero number, but for some reasons, for some other unrelated bug, this function fails. Uh, what we get is that uh, we're going to fall into the default case. We're going to get this error. The input is not zero or one. And we're going, we're going to continue propagating this error. And this was a little bit confusing because sometimes you don't know that this function can fail. Here it is very clear because I call it like that, but sometimes your call chain, uh, there are many levels and, you, and you, you didn't know how you ended up into this place and what, what was this error message telling you. So this was a, a little bit challenging because that was the only kind of failure that we, that we could uh, handle. Okay, now this is, I'm going to show you the, the relation between Open Modelica and System Modeler. As I told, as I told you before, uh, these projects were related. And basically, a big part of the code was shared. So Open Modelica is this project, and it had uh, these uh, two parts, the back end and the front end. The front end being uh, the the part of the code that is that does the model parsing, the initial simplification of the model. It also had a bunch of aux auxiliary libraries and data types. And on the open Modelica side, they have their backend, which is going to be the equation optimization, 
code generation and also interactive uh, interactive uh, uh, like a repo so from in system model we were taking this front end part which is where, which were all those files and then we were adding our own backend uh, which is again our own uh, equation optimization code generation etc so and since we were actually taking uh, the files and compiling or our project with it it was uh, we had a, we had a lot of problems for example that the api was not stable it was not clear uh, which which uh, functions which types etc we were using therefore the uh, when the open modelica uh, people for example they they make a, a big change they add a new feature and we want to take the changes since they didn't since they didn't have access to our source code they could be breaking completely a system modeler without knowing it and they cannot fix it so we had to spend a lot of time like uh, reviewing the changes that they were making and deciding which have impact which did not have and then of course running all or test and verify that everything it's it's working so it was a kind of tedious process and if, and even we were when we were uh, supporting open model the open model project we did not have like um, like the full control on what things they were implementing so if they wanted to refactor everything or change everything uh, we could not stop them we, we just needed to adapt to anything that they were doing so the the way we would like this to work it was something in this style where open modelica splits the project into this back end and front end and then there is a, a, a well-defined front end uh, with an api to which both projects system modeler and open modelica uh, could communicate uh, and and use that way uh, we could minimize uh, the the breaking changes and, and also have like a better control on, on what's what's happening there so when when we start facing all these problems it was when we start thinking that that we needed to do like something in order to to improve our situation and the initial approach that we had uh, it was to to create like this tool which i started uh, it was a, an f sharp based tool uh, that had as, as a task to uh, to parse and analyze all the open modelica code and from that code uh, i could do like a cleanup of everything that we didn't need and, 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 and extract only the parts that were significant for us and in order to obtain like this minimal open modelica front end and this, this was uh, quite nice because we could uh, like filter which which part of the commits uh, didn't have any impact on us and also we, we were getting like smaller diffs which were easier to interpret and then to adapt so and this and this tool was uh, was working quite quite okay we were using it for for some time but uh, this at this point it was when we started thinking i mean we have this minimal front end and we have uh, and we are basically just plugging our backend so our backend could be written in any other language we don't have to to use uh, metamodelica and this is the point when we started considering uh, something like this so we have the minimal front end still written in metamodelica uh, maintained by by open modelica and then we use we define an uh, an api and we create our backend in any programming language that, that we that we want and in order to have like this stable api uh, we could basically use only the data types so we we will be dropping all the all the functions that we rely on from here so if they make changes uh, to any function those changes do, are not propagated to to our to our side and 
yeah, once once we have this, once we, we start with this idea of having a separate programming language, uh, the way of communicating the data, it, it could be just by serializing the data, right? And, and having like a bidirectional communication between these two, two parts of the, of the project. And how, how could we exchange the data? So basically what we needed, it was like a way of, of generating automatically, uh, of automatically generating converters. So this is, this is uh, the data representation in Metamodelica, which is the, the, same, the same thing that I, that I showed before. Just we have a number, a variable, and a sum. And this is how it will look in F sharp. So it basically uh, direct mapping. And if we wanted uh, to move it to something like, like C, we could represent it as this, like having a tag and then a struct uh, that has the inner elements. So as, as you can see, it, it, once you have, once you shrink everything to just data types to use as API, you can represent them in, in any language. Okay, so yeah, we started this process of picking a, a, a new programming language and we wanted to, I mean, the language that we, that we ended up using, uh, we wanted to have as many of, of, of these features. I mean, the most desirable, fe the, the most desirable feature it was that uh, there should be a, a way of automatically convert the existing code base because we didn't want to, to rewrite everything from scratch. If we rewrite rewriting from scratch, it will be a, a very long and tedious process. We also wanted that the new language uh, had static types because uh, Metamodelica had stat static types and we really enjoy uh, catching most of the errors at compile time. So if your data structure change, uh, you can easily track all the places where this change will affect you and, and decide how you are going to how you're going to fix it. We also wanted wanted the language to have union types to represent all these complex data that we have. And of course pattern matching because we need uh, we needed an easy way of, of uh, processing all this symbolic data that we have. We want it to be functional because uh, it really simplifies the uh, writing complex behaviors and also if if this language will be succinct it will be much better so have less code with more meaning and we wanted a debugger because print debug sometimes is not enough and some of the bugs uh, is very useful to know how you ended up in that place we also wanted to have a uh, to, to have a language that was a little bit faster because this will be great for our users. If, if their model compiles faster, then it's good. And in, for the developers, we want it to be a language that could be fast compiled because if we, if we have to do iterations on the code, that's, that's always nice to, to not wait too much on the code to be compiled. And then, so at this point, we also started checking uh, different languages and we were thinking on, okay, let's, how, how can we compare them? Uh, so we need some benchmarks. So I found the computer language uh, benchmark game and very quickly I found out that this was not representative at all of our problem. Uh, that we, in order to, to create a, like a, a benchmark, that would be good for us. Uh, I needed to, 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 to do something that looks more like the kind of task that we solve. So uh, what kind of task we solve is, uh, it would, sorry? Okay, uh, we, 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 we wanted to, to perform symbolic manipulation of expressions we wanted also to, to evaluate expressions uh, like store, lookup values. We also needed the common graph operations. So for, for that, I created like a, like a small program that was very easy to translate to different languages and will perform this kind of task and, and will help us to, to, to understand how the language, how we could express this 
algorithm in different languages and also test the performance. And these are the results that, that I got back then. Uh, you can see that in the y-axis, I have the time that it took to execute um, this, this benchmark. On the x, we have the, the lines of code that were used to, to write the, the program. And yeah, the first thing that we can see is that the language that we were using, Metamodelica, it took about 40 seconds to execute. And it was uh, more than 300 lines of code to, to express this algorithm. So it, was, it is quite verbose and slow. And on, down here, we have C++, which was quite fast, two, three seconds, but also required like hundreds of lines of code. And that's without counting uh, the, the STD library, right? Because there were some, some calls were used here that uh, that simplify on the other extreme we have mathematica which uh, it took about 20 something seconds but this is this language is very compact and very succinct and it took us around 50 lines of code to to express the same algorithm we also tested f sharp which was my favorite programming language back then and you can see it was around almost 20 seconds Haskell, it's, it's laying around here, around 10 seconds, uh, a little bit over uh, 100 lines. And then we have OCaml here, which was, it was, it looks like a very good compromise between the, the, the execution time and the, line, and the lines of code uh, that, that, we, that we generated. And we also did another, another benchmark, which was uh, like a, a very similar algorithm, but using only numerical uh, computations. And since, and by using numerical computations, it's but much easier to port to other languages. And these are the results. So again, the programming language that we're using, it's, it was the slowest and also the one that required the most, uh, more lines of code. C++ was the fastest with also quite some lines of code. OCaml, uh, it was the same, like a very good compromise between speed and lines of code. Then we have Lua JIT and also PyPy, which I will believe is like a JIT version of Python and F Sharp, very similar to, to OCaml. So, I mean, you already know what was the winner because that's the title of this presentation. But still, I'm going to explain you the rationale behind uh, why we selected OCaml. So these are the languages that, for us, had like a very strong uh, con. The first one, even when C++ was the fastest, uh, it, it, C, uh, C is quite quite a verbose language, and you have to do everything from scratch. So it it, it will be very hard for us to co to automatically convert our code into C, into C, uh, into C++, considering that we had to, to, to add more code for uh, memory management, et cetera. So it would, it wouldn't be very readable after converting, converting it. We also dropped F sharp because we found that uh, back then, it was, this was around 2014, we found that F sharp was quite, quite fast in, in .NET. But uh, compared to Linux and Mac, it was slow. It was running on top of Mono. And, and we didn't want that. We want something that behaves similarly because we, our product uh, runs uh, in Linux, Mac, and Windows. And we wanted to, to have the same experience in all of them. Then we also dropped Haskell because uh, when we started thinking how, how we had to convert our existing code base, there were some side effects and we actually needed like a smarter uh, converter tool in order to fit into the into the Haskell uh, complete pure uh, way of writing the code. It was a, a bit challenging. So the main contenders were uh, OCAM because it, it was it is quite fast and it's also quite close to Metamodelica. So basically, we could, we could map most of the constructs directly to, to OCaml. And, and the other uh, contender it was, it was Mathematica or, or the Wolfram language, because 
Uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's a language that it is used in-house and it is very succinct. It, it also has a lot, lot of functionality. So we could have uh, deleted uh, many, many, many lines of code, but uh, it, was, it, it is also challenging to, to do an automatic translation because uh, some of the fastest ways of doing uh, something in Wolfram language uh, are, are not, we, we could map them very well to what we do in Metamodelica. So we also had this problem that making a good uh, translation uh, will be difficult. So we picked Ockham because we will have, uh, in theory, uh, a performance increase for from 5x to 10x. We will have a decent uh, reduction of the code. And the most important uh, feature it was that uh, when I was doing all these benchmarks and all these experiments with different languages, uh, uh, there was a version of OCaml that released uh, syntax extensions. And I could use this mechanism of, of extending uh, the OCaml language in order to create even uh, to create code that was going to be very readable and that match very well uh, the, meta the Metamodelica code that we have. So in order to, to do this task, I, I created this uh, program, the Metamodelica to OCaml converter. And the basic idea was to parse all the code and analyze all the error paths uh, in the Metamodelica code, then perform simplifications to like that code elimination, detecting unreachable code, simplifying uh, like silly code, and also uh, simplifying the match. I, I could do as well a uh, simplification of the error paths. And, and the most important points was that we needed to generate code that was very readable and also being uh, very idiomatic. And we, and we wanted to preserve all the comments. So all the original comments in the Metamodelica code, we wanted to, to drag them because we had implementation details, function documentation, etc. And after experimenting with this, with this converter, this is uh, this is an example of, of of what we got. I have this function uh, main, uh, which uh, is translated to this into OCaml. This safe call is this in OCaml and on safe call. But the important thing here is that uh, uh, the way this function will execute in Metamodelica. Uh, translated very, very nice to, to OCaml. So what I have here, I have uh, this function that takes, uh, uh, yeah, it just produces an output. The first thing that it does, it performs this safe call. So it's basically a function that cannot fail. Then we call this on safe call, which the way I define it, it just returns a failure and then uh, binds the output to one. And this is converted as, as this. So we have, we call the safe code and it's just a, a let binding. And then we call the unsafe code. And what you see here is one of the extensions that, that, we, that we implemented, which is a, a monadic binding. It's basically uh, uh, this function, unsafe code, uh, could return either a success or a failure. If the function return a success, then the value is bound to be and we return the number one. So this, this was quite, quite nice because uh, if, if you take a look at this code, we can clearly see all the places where, uh, I mean, it's, it, it is the, the error handling, is, it is not hidden in the code. In this side, in this side of the code, you, you don't see at all uh, that this, function can fail, but here it is, it is very obvious because it has a percentage F. Mm -hmm. So to give you a, an example on, on how we kept improving on, on this converter in order to get what we wanted. So we have uh, this, this function is, is the same that I presented before. If you have as, if you have as input a zero, it will call this on safe call. 
a one, it will immediately return one. And we had this default case, which was an error propagation. And this was converted into this piece of OCaml. It looks pretty much like OCaml, but it, it has this special percentage continue, which is the, a syntax extension that we, that we created to replicate this behavior. So what's going to happen is, uh, specifically in this point, where the unsafe call is, is uh, performed, if this one fails, uh, is going to continue to the, to the next. Uh, since it doesn't match, it's going to continue to the next and it's going to, to return a failure. And once we had this, this converter, we, we could start doing the, the error uh, propagation analysis, like in this case. So this is the, exactly the same code, but we added uh, in the default case, a print statement, which this was a pattern, a pattern that we had uh, all around the code. So we have a last case that is going to report an error and then uh, propagate the failure. Since we had, uh, this was a common pattern, <coughs> we, we uh, implemented in the converter a way of, create, uh, of turning this into a, an OCaml exception. So it will look like this. If, you're, if you input any number that is not zero or one, or if this function uh, called it fails, it's going to fall into this one and we're going to get an OCaml exception. So the, the, that, that failure propagation change is, is broken. And, and because we know that this function either succeeds or returns an exception, we, we consider this like a safe return function and which means that, that we can prefix it with this and we can, we can uh, and we don't have to, to implement the, the error propagation for every call of this function. And then we could start doing, uh, so one, one thing that happened is that once we start seeing the, the generated OCAM code and all the, and all the error propagation paths, the, uh, it was clear for us that in many places, we did not expect the code to behave that way. So we were able of jumping back to the original code uh, fixing it and then running the converter again and then we can see uh, the result which was more what we we expected it uh, this one is the same code the only change is that i turn the unsafe call into a safe call so this function that that, that i didn't know uh, i fix it so it always succeeds and the converter automatically detected that there were there was no no error path that the it wasn't needed any error propagation so this this becomes a simple match and we have this default case which is going to throw an exception which is a, uh, which is a, an exceptional case that we need to record that we could easily recover in or not uh, <laughs> depending on the situation. Okay, the, the, and the next part that we needed to sort to, to sort out, it was the, sorry. The next part that we needed to sort out, it was the, the data, data conversions. So we have again, the, the Metamodelica data representation, which is turned into OCAM like this. And since we know exactly the, the shape of this data, we could create this, uh, C, this uh, C functions that will do the hunting. So we could take a, a, a metamodelica value and convert it to OCaml and vice versa. So we could exchange data between the two programming languages. So, and yeah, so going back to, to our benchmark, we run the converter into this, into the original code for, of our benchmark. And this is the result that we got. So I, I have to mention that here, not all the optimizations that we implemented were, were yet ready, but we could see uh, this behavior. So the Metamodelica code converted to OCAM, we immediately got uh, a significant, uh, 
performance improvement and also a reduction of the lines of code, which was quite good. And this code was perfectly readable. Uh, I would say that it was even more readable than the original. So yeah, and this is this is how we implemented it. We had the system modeler kernel running the original Metamodelica frontend, and we just passed in, and we had as a slave the the OCAM code, and we send the data and we just fetch back the data. And this is the result that we got. Uh, so in red we have system modeler four point two, which is uh, the version that Intel that had this combined OCAM and Metamodelica languages, and the, the other two uh, didn't have it. And these are the results of, of some of the scalability tests that we have. So these are quite large models that we can run and we can check how, how, how the code is performing. And here we have the, the, what's the performance improvement? Like in this specific model, we got 2.x of performance, 3.2 times faster, 4.8, 10 times faster in this model. And in this one, uh, the original code didn't even finish. And the, the OCAM code was finishing uh, quite fast. So it, it was a quite, it was a good improvement. And once we had the, the code in, in, in OCAM, uh, we got a bunch of things that were very useful for example lots of warnings in the compiler because now we can uh, enable uh, warnings for unused variables on use arguments to functions uh, uncover uh, cases in, in the pattern matching in, in also redundant cases and yeah once we have this we could do uh, manually a, a big cleanup of, of the source code we also got a lot of useful libraries from the ocam ecosystem and very important, we got the tools, uh, IntelliSense, uh, and the one that I like the most is the, the OCAM uh, time traveling debugger, uh, which can go backwards. So sometimes the, uh, catching an error is quite, quite easy. You just run the debugger, when it fails, it will stop automatically, and then you just jump backwards, and then you know exactly the conditions that, that produce this error. There is a parser generator, and another one that I like a lot is the code for matter because we can we can all create a code uh, that is uh, very consistent. And other uh, language features which are quite nice, like the uh, things that we didn't have in in Metamodelica, like anonymous functions, covered functions, if expressions, nested pattern matching, and more advanced. Uh, things in OCAM like the functors, which are parameterized modules, uh, the strong typing and the type inference, etc. So once we we reach uh, that point in which we had system modeler, like parts of system modeler written in OCAM, part it, it was still in in, in Metamodelica. Uh, the people from from Open Modelica uh, started working on metamodelica version 2 which uh, which then it was to fix many of those errors uh, or problems of metamodelica 1 but one thing that we didn't like too much it was that the new uh, metamodelica had too many imperative features and and they were using it in order to to speed up the the execution of, of the compiler so the the code started uh, uh, in the code start, they started popping up mutability pieces everywhere and those make, make it a little bit more complicated to analyze the error paths. And yeah, it was harder to analyze and optimize. So we, take, we took the decision that we, that we were going to convert everything into OCaml. And since we already had the tools, we just run the converter again and we ended up with this new uh, system model kernel, which is 99% uh, written in OCAM, a little bit of C++. And uh, I mean, it was practically 510,000 lines of Metamodelica when were converted to 220 lines of OCAM, which was a reduction of 
about 43%. And yes, in the stage, the, the stage the, that we are now is we are replacing the open Modelica frontend that we converted into a new one, which is written from scratch in idiomatic OCaml. And we're now that we know better OCaml, we're taking advantage of many of the nice features that are available in the language. Yeah, as a conclusion, uh, yeah, OCaml really helped us unleash the real functional world of programming in, inside System Modeler. And we got performance improvements that went from 2x to 10x. Uh, the resulting code is, is easier to read than before. And the features uh, of OCaml, like the static typing and, and all the integrated warnings, have helped us to fix bugs, uh, to find and fix bugs, and focus our testing efforts uh, in a different way because we don't need to test. Uh, every tiny function, but we can create uh, some kind of testing that, that, that are a little bit larger, that test a feature just as the user will uh, experience it. And the most important is that before we started this in OCAM, fixing a problem uh, in the compiler took us from some days up to weeks, and nowadays, just using Ocam, it takes it can take us from a few hours to two days. So uh, our development process is much much faster. And that's it. Thank you very much for your attention. And if you have questions, uh, just let me know. Yes, thank you very much, Leonardo. Very good presentation. Really like it. I actually have one question here from uh, from a guy in the chat. Uh, from a viewer. Um, <clears throat> can you expand on the OCaml functors? Yes. So, I mean, you, you know that in functional programming that you can, having a function, you can uh, make it more complex by passing another function, right? So, in OCaml, you have uh, modules, which are basically packages of functions, and you can uh, parameterize them by passing another another module. The most common case uh, is, for example, making a, a map or a map, uh, a, a tree map or a, a data structure like that, mm -hmm. in which you write your code. But the data type that you put in, that you put in uh, can be different. Uh, so in order to create a concrete map, for example, a map of the strings, you pass the, the module corresponding to, to the strings. And, and that expo that exposes uh, what's your data, and also what comparison function to use. So if, yeah. if you want to to have a like a different data type, you just pass another another module, and that's basically the OCaml functors. Okay, thanks. One more question. There is a question. One guy wonders if you have um, tried to do the the benchmarking again with the new uh, .NET. Uh, Core six version. Of no, I actually short. haven't. No. When I when I was preparing this presentation, I, I was thinking I, I should I should run all the benchmarks <laughs> to see <laughs> yeah, how, exactly. how they, they stand in twenty twenty one. Yeah, yeah I, I I will do it uh, at yeah. some point. Is the I had another question. I mean, I I really like your benchmark because I think that's really important to look, both look at the speed, but also like what what's kind of you know the development experience or the developer experience when coding in a certain language. I mean, about lines of code and etc. Is this open source in any way, or is this like you kept it for yourself? Or have you put it on a public repo somewhere? No, actually, I actually didn't publish it at all. Uh, no, it's uh, I I'm going to check if I can if I can uh, uh, document it a little bit hmm? and and publish it. Yeah, that would be very interesting. I, I guess there's a lot of people. I mean, benchmarking is always interesting. There's always different features for different languages. Sometimes you just need right. speed. Sometimes you want less code. And yeah, there's all sorts of things. I, I think you made a really good, um, what do you call it, a case for why you choose OCaml. It seems to really, <laughs> really nice, actually. Mm -hmm. You went through, yeah, it was, it was really nice. Uh, oh, yeah, one more question. Um, if you would do this now, would you consider Yulia as a Yulia as a programming language instead? Uh, I, 
Yes, I mean, I was, uh, uh, as well, when I was present, when I was preparing for this presentation, I was thinking, yeah, probably Julia and Rust would be nice to include in the, in the mm. benchmark to see how they stand. Mm. But probably not Julia, because uh, I really like, uh, as if I understand correctly, Julia is, is, is a dynamic typing language. And we do rely a lot on the, on the data types. So yep. probably not Julia, most probably Rust. Okay. Thanks. I have, I have one more question. Um, what was hardest to do this conversion? Keep what in the was... comments. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so yeah, you're like, you uh, converted, how to keep the comments and figure out this is comment and this is code and... Yeah, this is comment and this this goes into this line and, it, and in the resulting code it needs to be attached into this place okay because you don't want a comment that says like do not remove this line of code and ends up being in another line <laughs> some stuff like that <laughs> no total confusing is that then when you read yeah. it like oh this doesn't match at all <laughs> yeah it is probably the yes. hardest part comments yeah again oh uh oh yeah how long did it take and how many persons the, the worked on it? Yeah, the, to to do the switch to OCaml. And it, it was it was a process. I think that we did it in two two or three versions that we of releasing a system model. So it probably would be it was like a one year and a half. But we did it in a very safe way, as mm -hmm. as I as I showed. So we started with first just converting the code to see how it looks, starting fixing bugs, preparing. Mm -hmm. The original code in order to, to be uh, readable. Then we did this uh, like this small uh, tra transitioning as a small part of the code, see, seeing that the technology works fine, mm -hmm. it's changing data, that there is no uh, corruption, no. Uh, and then, yeah, so it was like probably one from one year and a half to two years. Uh, gradually doing it yeah how many people were you were you on your own or no no it was me and uh, and the the person that helped me the most it was uh, uh, carl and another another developer yeah has it been worth it from a business perspective to do this have you increased speed or quality or yeah i mean the, definitely the, the productivity is much much better as i mentioned before it it, it could take weeks to find a bug mm. and now it's it is quite easy <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay it's just a few hours <laughs> <laughs> good <laughs> it's nice yes again thank you very much leonardo and thanks for your presentation and thank great having you with us thank you thank you yep you're welcome with that said we're go gonna hand over to the, our next presenter brucio and uh, you're Welcome, Brujo. Hello. Brujo, actually. But yeah. Brujo, Hi. sorry. No problem. Yeah, sorry. Yes, welcome, Brujo. Uh, and your presentation, Erlang Oddities. That's it. So, welcome, and the stage is yours. All right, thank you very much. So, this is a presentation called Erlang Oddities. It's a little bit slightly old, it has a couple of years since I first uh, gave this talk. It was in a conference in Buenos Aires and it was in Spanish. So we will see how it goes in English now. So I'm Brujo Benavides. I am currently living in Spain, but uh, I come from Buenos Aires, Argentina. I've been working with Erlang for more than a decade. I've been working as a developer, uh, as a trainer. I organized uh, conferences and events and whatnot. But most importantly for this talk, Around the year 2016, I created my blog. It's called Erlang Battleground. And at this time, it has more than 50 or 60 articles there. And more of, most of them are about Erlang oddities. Particular details in Erlang that are funny or interesting or you know amusing. So uh, I encourage you all to read that. Over here, I collected a couple of them, but uh, of course, not all of them. And this talk is based on this other talk. 
uh, is a talk called What? Uh, and it's delivered by Gary Bernhardt. And it's uh, hosted on Destroy All Software uh, slash talks slash what? It's a very, very funny one. One of my favorite talks uh, about software from, from all of them. And if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to see it as well, to watch it, because it's, uh, it's just five minutes long and you will get a, a proper laugh about it. And uh, our profession is not to be taken too seriously, and Gary knows that. So, but I am not Gary. I am a regular guy. Gary is, is a, a programmer, but he's also a stand up comedian. So, in this talk, I will try to make it as funny as possible, but most likely I won't get to Gary's levels of uh, hilariousness. Uh, to compensate for that, I will include many, many puns because I'm a dad, so I will do dad jokes all the time. And in this time, you will have to bear with me. Also, this talk was first conceived to be delivered live to people, to an audience. And I don't have a, a laugh track here, so I hope everybody is laughing at home. And if you're not, I will imagine that you are laughing at home. Uh, to, to kick off this thing, um, let me present the issue at hand. It's a story about an interview where uh, one exercise that's part of a technical interview, you know that, uh, that process that we all love in our profession, is to write the code for a FISBAS uh, algorithm. Uh, and these are the rules. We need to write a, a script that's given a parameter, it's called n, and it prints all integers number, all integer numbers that are below it, one after the other. And for each one, if the number is divisible by three, it prints fizz. If it's divisible by five, it prints bus. But if it, the number if it is divisible by both, it has to print fizz bus. It has to print an error if uh, the provided parameter is not a number. And for whatever reason, it has to work with floating point number two. Particular part of this is uh, that you, we usually oversee is that in this case it has to be a script. It doesn't. It, it's not expected to be just a function. It, it actually has to be runnable on command line. I will get to that by the end of the presentation. So, myself, Erlang developer, faced with this task, I will try to do it as wrongfully as I can possibly do it. So in the worst possible way, I will try to solve this exercise. So first, uh, if you've ever seen an Erlang module, uh, it starts with a module declaration. But most, even the most experienced Erlang developers have never seen a module like this one. Because usually, in every documentation, uh, the, the attribute module contains an argument, FISBAS, between parentheses. But for like trying dumb stuff on my computer, I discovered that those parentheses are actually optional. So this thing, this sole line with the, the colon at the end, is actually a, a complete Erlang module. If you go to a console, you can compile it. And it compiles. Perfect. It does nothing, it has no functions, but it exists. Um, so let's start adding some actual stuff to it. So the first thing I will do is to add a function called up to, which, which takes a, a number, and then calls an auxiliary function where I will write it in a recursive uh, manner so that it goes through the list from one to number and it prints all the numbers. Printing in Erlang is IO format, and that uh, string interpolation with the P uh, replaces the p by the parameter provided. And so this function basically traverses, uh, or like goes through the numbers one after the other until we reach a point where um, we get the number that's larger than the top number. In this case, it prints um, tilde n, and that prints a new line, so it just terminates. Let's see if my code works. On a console, we can try to compile the module again, and it compiles. 
And if we run the function that I that is exported up to one uh, like a number, it actually works. But uh, of course, the exercise required many more things. This is just the first step. So far, so good. So the next step will be because I I choose so to implement error handling, error detection. So to deal with what happens when uh, a parameter is not a number. As, you, you, as I showed you before, I have this auxiliary function where I said I have two clauses. One is for when top is larger or equal than i, and the other one is when top is um, smaller, shorter than i. So I can add the uh, validation of numericness uh, to them, like this. So uh, basically, the first clause will be evaluated when the provided parameter is a number, and uh, it is larger or equal than the uh, iterator. And the second one will be evaluated when the provided parameter is a number, but it's uh, shorter than the iterator. And then I have to add the error display, something that happens when uh, it is not a number. So in any other case, I will print an error message like this and return error. And that code looks perfectly reasonable. So we go to the console, we compile the module. It compiles, nice code, perfect. So we try with something that's not a number. That thing is an atom. In Erlang, you can write words, and those are considered atoms, as long as you don't use special characters or uh, uppercase or whatever. So. So that thing should, provide, should print the error and return error. And that's what it does. And now the interesting part starts. In, in, usually, I will ask the audience, what do they think this would do? So remember that we have the guards saying that if it is a number and it's larger than or smaller than, whatever, and it runs the same algorithm as before. I didn't change the, algorithm, the previous algorithm. So it should print 1 to 10. But instead, it tells me that 10 is not a number. And why, right? How, how did that happen? Well, turns out that AND has a smaller precedence than the larger and equal uh, sign. And that means that the code actually says, actually evaluates the first class when is number top and top all the thing is larger or equal than one which can never be because it's either true or false and it's a smaller than number so even when it's readable it's wrong and how do you fix that well you have to use another version of and this one and also and also is a short circuit operator and so this time it evaluates everything to the left of it first and if that is true, then it evaluates whatever is on the right. If not, it's false. So it has, uh, by design, it has a larger precedence. It works as, as expected. So if you ever end up writing code in Erlang and you put and, be careful. Strange things may happen there. Um, so we compile just to, to verify that I'm not lying to you. And we try with something that's not a number, and of course, it fails because it doesn't match any guard. But if we try with something up to 10, it works. Perfectly fine. Now, let's start, uh, let's move the validation to the proper place because it was there just to show you the, the what bad things can happen. So I put the validation first, not in every step in the recursive function, I put it on the outside. So up to number, if it's a number, it goes to the internal function. If it's not the number, it prints the error there. Just for the sake of it, let's try again and compile and let me and let's see if I didn't make any mistakes. It does compile, prints an error when it's an error, and of course it counts to 10 as expected. That's fine. And now we will start adding uh, fees and bus and all those things. So what's the deal here? I could implement the fees and bath part in multiple ways, but as I told you already, I will do it in the most incorrect possible way. 
So Erlang is a functional programming language. I will do it imperatively, just because. And I will use the worst possible uh, keyword in Erlang, which is if. But even in that case, the code looks reasonable. It looks like this. If the, the number I'm going to print is divisible by three, so the reminder of three is zero, it prints this. If the reminder is uh, of five is zero, it prints bus. I don't need a clause for when it, the reminder is uh, zero for three and five, because since they are printed in order, it will actually print this bus as expected. But I need a clause for when it's neither. So if it's not a multiple of three nor five, it will print the number as it was printing before. After printing that, it prints a space and moves to the next step. Easy peasy. Let's see how that works. We compile the thing, fine. We run up to 10. And if you expect here to start seeing feces and buses, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but there are no true branches when evaluating an if expression. What just happened is a consequence of Erlang being of Erlang functions being composed of multiple expressions. So if everything inside an if from an if to an end has to be an expression. And so if it doesn't match one of the any of the classes, you still need to match something to, to be to let that expression evaluate to a proper value. And so you have to add an else. Basically, there are no else less ifs in uh, Erlang. You have to add an else everywhere. And an else uh, looks like this. Semicolon through arrow. And uh, why? Well, nobody bothered to add an else keyword. And so basically, you have to complete all the clauses. And a clause that matches everything that is always true is of course, true. So that's the that's the way to do else in, in Erlang. You can see how nobody, like why nobody likes ifs in general, but nobody likes else says in Erlang because this thing is very, very ugly and uh, everybody wants to write code without it. There are good ways of doing that thing, for instance, using uh, pattern matching on function clauses, case expressions, some other things, but also many wrong ways to uh, skip the else less if. And I will show you three of them today. And But just to, to be uh, consistent, I will compile this version of the code and run it up to 10. And as, as you can see, it works. As you can see also, there is no fees bus there. It's fees and bus, but not fees bus because I didn't reach a multiple of three and five, like 15. So maybe if I run this, we will run into another a different error that I can show you, but not this time, not today. Now let's move on to the else-less ifs. So, you see, the goal here is that you see, you see how the camera had to zoom on the slide. There is too much text. We want to remove the second column. That's our goal. So everywhere that there is an if with three rows, we want one row there. And the first way to do it, and I tell you, these are wrong ways not to do it. You don't have to do this with your code, but on the other hand, these are real ways. I found all examples of all of them during my, my work in different companies uh, that I will not mention uh, in, in Erlang. The first one is this very, very creative one with our old friend and also. We moved from this to this. What did we do? We turned an if with an else in with an else that we didn't want into something that it's a Boolean expression, but it's short circuiting. So if the first path is false, then the whole expression is false and the right side of and also is not evaluated. And 
if the, the left part is true, the right side of Andoso is evaluated. And since Erlang is a dynamic type uh, language, it doesn't matter if it doesn't return a Boolean. Erlang just evaluates that thing and returns whatever goes with it. And since we are dropping the, the value of this expression, we are not using it for anything, it's fine. And so this is basically an expression that either returns true or prints, uh, either returns false or prints this, which is exactly what we wanted. And we can check it out. We run it up to 25 and effectively works. So one out, two to go. We got the second one. And now this one will be super, super tricky. Uh, if you're not used to Erlang, and particularly if you're not used to list comprehensions, it will be complex to understand, but let's see what we can do. So basically, we will turn this thing into this one-liner. This is a list comprehension. If you are familiar with, uh, say, Elixir or Python or whatever, it's for this enumerable thing, do this thing, or filter it this way, do this thing with every item. In Erlang, that thing is written this way. To the left of the double pipe, is the expression to be evaluated for each item. And to the right of the double pipe, there are the filters, the generators, and the filters. But as you can see there, you can write the list comprehension without generators. So basically, you don't take your input from anywhere. You put a filter or many filters on the right, and you put an expression on the left. And because these comprehensions are a syntax sugar in Erlang, this is not rejected by the compiler, nor the runtime. This is turned into some nested case statement with anonymous functions and something like that. And basically does the, same, the following thing. If the filters are all true, in this case, we have just one. So if, if uh, I, uh, the reminder of five for I is zero, then this will generate a, sing a list with a single element. And that element will be computed using the expression on the left side of the double pipe. In this case, whatever the result of your format bus is. But if at least one filter is false, then uh, the, this expression will not be evaluated the expression on the left side of the double pipe would not be evaluated, and this whole expression will end up being an empty list. So, as you can see, this actually serves our purpose. Because when, uh, when the item is not divisible by five, uh, the empty list has no elements, EO format is never evaluated, we don't see buses there where they should not be. But at this point, let me digress a little bit on these, well, these things that I would like to call list incomprehensions. And let me show you something more that I couldn't include in the example. So as I told you, this is a list comprehension with just a filter, no generator. If the filter is false, the result, the expression evaluates to an empty list. If the filter is true, the expression evaluates to a single element, as a list with a single element, which is the expression on the left. And now, think about it. If the expression is neither true nor false, should the, should we, should the compiler just fail, like tell you that you don't have not a generator, not even a filter there? I, I would expect so, but that doesn't happen. Or maybe the runtime. Okay, if the compiler can catch it, maybe the runtime can. And so if you run this thing, uh, it will tell you that you have a wrong generator there or a wrong filter, or this thing doesn't make any sense. I cannot provide the result for it. But actually, if you run this thing, this is what happens. So basically, only if the filter is true, you get a list with a single element, anything else, empty list. And I think I could live with that. 
I thought I would live with that until I found this thing. This is the famous identity function. It returns anything that, that you gave. You give a banana, it gives you a banana. Easy. It's a function, anonymous function, that's fine. And so identity of false is false. And so this list comprehension is, of course, an empty list. Perfect. And identity of true is true. So this list comprehension is, of course, a list with a single element. Fine. And this expression is uh, something. So this is, of course, an empty. OK. What? <laughs> why? Why are you complaining about bad filter now? And why, if there is an exception called bad filter, it's not returned in line 24? I don't know. I once tried to check the code behind this thing in the in the Erlang OTP implementation, and I couldn't reach any reasonable place to find this. I'm probably the only Erlang programmer in the world trying this kind of weird stuff. So it's a uh, homework. You can do your research and figure out what's going on here. And if you find more strange situations with these incomprehensions, please let me know. I already have two blog post about it, I will, I will be extremely happy to write the third one. And by the way, those people that they are fighting belong to, to an organization called the World Taekwondo Federation. They choose the best acronym in the world for, for their organization. I actually have a couple of friends there and uh, I, they told me that uh, either they already changed the name or they are planning to change it because even if you try to Google it, it you, you fail completely. So anyway, moving on. Back to our problem. We still have one if that we don't want the else clause there. And uh, remember that the issue here is that on runtime, if you don't have the else clause, if you don't have a true clause, it will trigger an exception, an error telling you that you don't have a true clause. So if it, since that is in runtime, that thing is an exception, you can catch an exception. There is an elegant way of catching exceptions in, Erl in, in Erlang with try, catch, whatnot. I will tell you a couple of things about it later. But there is also an inelegant way of catching exceptions, which is this one. We turn that thing into this. That catch there is basically swallowing every possible error in the expression on the right. And so, if the if expression fails, the error will disappear. It will be returned as, as the value of the expression in, in general, but we are not assigning it to any variable, so it's fine. And, um, and if you cannot see what's the issue with this, what's wrong with this implementation, uh, remember that catch swallows every error in the whole expression, not just in the, in the guard, in the if clause. It's everything. If your code in the inside the if fails, it will also swallow the exception. But since our code, it's just a, something printing out something in the console, we don't care. And then we can compile our program, run it, and there you go. Perfect. And now, since we compressed all the else uh, clauses, we remove all the else clauses, we can go back to just one column. Genius. Amazing. I, I, uh, I personally uh, requesting like sorry to uh, saying sorry to your future colleagues and even your future self if you ever try to maintain this code. But the code is small. I give you that. So uh, this is Erlang and this is a module that uh, runs the FISBUS algorithm as requested. But uh, if you ever see Erlang mentioned everywhere, you will also see some other words uh, around it. So where is OTP here? Everybody tells me that Erlang is Erlang OTP. You have to use OTP, you have to use a gen server, you have to use the framework. So let's use the framework. We go to, we go to the Erlang documentation, we Google for it, we find uh, a very nice uh, gen server implementation there. So we copy the implementation and we end up with this. To the right of it, we have the uh, recursive function that we know, and we are not going to change anywhere because we don't want to maintain that code anymore. 
the, this is a this is a function worth of a comment saying don't touch this so we will remove it so we cannot we don't see it anymore done back to one column with a hidden part on the right and so we're implementing a hand server let's start with the worst possible implementation of a, hand, of a gen server ever but it's copied from the documentation so it has to work it's basically this we start the gen server called module like the same module that we are that's a macro with the with the question mark there is a macro and as the uh, as a parameter we provide the number and no options there that's the third part no options and so if it returns uh, if it creates a process then we return OK. And if it doesn't create a process, we print, uh, because it returns an error, we print the IO format there with not the number as we did before. So when the process is started by gen server start link, what uh, will happen is that the new process will evaluate the init function with the provided uh, parameter, uh, this one. This function, basically, uh, as it's expressed in the airline documentation clearly, it can return either OK and the state of the gen server or stop and, um, and, and an error. And so the, the gen server is not even initialized. The process is terminated immediately. So uh, we are abusing gen server a bit because we are starting servers and not stopping them. So, so every time we run this function, we will have a new server that sits idle in the background. But for starters, this should be a really simple and uh, working implementation of this. So let's compile the model as usual. Uh, but just happened. And uh, if you see, I copied everything from uh, the web, from the documentation, the airline documentation. You can go check it. Uh, but I didn't copy one very very important thing remember when we started this whole presentation i created a module with just one line well that line compiled in every single iteration until this point but not now because even if the parentheses are optional if you don't put the parentheses the module macro is not defined and if the module macro is not defined you cannot use it of course so this is required if you are going to use that macro. My advice, don't use macros, period. Not that one, not any other one. But uh, if you are going to use it, you have to use parentheses like this. Now it compiles. And if you want to run up to 25, perfectly fine. We have an angle gen server. We are leaking gen servers in memory, but that doesn't matter. And, uh, and so the other thing that we need to try is what happens if we provide uh, improper input, not the number. And so we expect to see something that says the, the prints out the error, not the number, blah. And that's not it, that's an exception exit, which is nice, but it's not exactly what we were expecting. It's a little bit different. Remember, we, we actually wanted a message saying not a number and then the provided input. And instead, we got an exception. OK, let's see what we can do. So we got an exception, right? How do we deal with exceptions? We add a try catch. I told you there is an elegant way in Erlang to handle exceptions. It's one. We add a try. We add a catch and we print the exception, right? OK, let's go. So we compile. We try with the number. Mm -hmm. The exception like went through our try catch and directly into the shell. We are not very happy with this. So remember, I told you there is an inelegant way to catch exception. Let's use that thing catch should swallow the exception mm -hmm. okay let's try with another try and now we try like this 
So if there is an exception in the shell, we should see an, a tuple X with the exception. And nope. But our friend Chuck here has the answer. The thing here is that exit signals travel faster than exceptions. And since the shell, the process shell is restarted every time it dies, but printing the exception first, we can trap exit signals from the other process. And if we do, then we see the, the error message. How, how uh, or why do we get those super fast exit signals first, uh, except if we uh, trap them? Well, this is the thing. We copy the code, and the code says start link. And start link links the process uh, where we try to print out the FISBAS uh, numbers and words with the one that we were working on, the shell. Since they are linked, when one dies, the other dies as well. But the shell is restarted. So we don't know this, that, it was, that we are actually in a different process. But we are. So we can change that, not link the processes, let the agent server die, and they don't emit exit signals, and we're fine. So we use a start instead of a start link. There you go. Compiling. We go back to the previous state so that if the server crashes and it's linked, we will see an exception. I didn't forget, you see. Uh, but we try with an error, and of course, it brings out the expected message. Cool. But this gen server, as I told you, is leaking. It's not the way of implementing gen servers. The idea here is to have a server running and ask the server for things, uh, multiple ones, not just a single one. So let's try it with a proper server. Instead of this thing, we move to this other thing. So what I did was changing start so that the initial parameter, the number, is not provided there. We have to, you have to start the server first, and then you can call up to a number. And when you call up to a number, the server then uh, prints out the fees bus and the numbers and keeps running. So you can ask multiple times. You can ask all the times you want as long as the server is running. But there is one particular detail here. I removed the number as the parameter for init. So I put something else. I put nothing. Nothing. And let me digress a little bit about why I did that. Remember, I copied the gen server implementation from the uh, OTP docs. And they say this. Basically, this is the tricky part. When you call gen server start link, or for what is worth, when you call gen server start, it's the same. You can provide four parameters. The first one is the name for the gen server, in this case, CH3. The second one is the module implementing the gen server, in this case, CH3. That's why we use, we generally use a, a question mark module. The third one is the argument for the initial function. And the fourth one is the list of options on how to start the gen server. But again, the third parameter it's specified as the list of arguments for the initial function. But how many arguments does the initial function have? Just one. This is one of the things that I keep uh, finding students, because I, I worked as a trainer, I keep finding students failing to grasp this concept time and time again. And the, the way to solve it is actually pretty simple. It's in the documentation. The problem is in the documentation, not in the implementation of things. So basically, over here, the list with X in there, students usually think of the list of arguments to uh, init. And if it has one argument, it's a list with one element. So they implement init with uh, an argument, single one, which is the X that they receive. And as you can imagine, this clearly fails because you cannot sum a list with an X plus two. That fails. Because args is not a list of arguments. Args is actually an argument, a single one. It's the argument for init. Why 
do the Erlang dogs have a list? Because they used to think that uh, using a list was the right way to pass multiple arguments to init if you need to. Say if you need to pass two arguments like this. But actually, that's, a, that's not the right way to do it because the lists are usually stuff for uh, changing uh, the for, for things that change size uh, across time. You add elements, you remove elements, you filter, whatever. So my advice is not to use lists for that. Instead, use a tuple. Tuple are fixed size. So if you need two things, you put those two things into one tuple. Or even better, you can use a map with name arguments, like first and second and whatnot. And if you don't have anything to provide to the server, since you still have one argument, you have to provide something, and everyone has atoms, you can provide nothing. That's it. And now, back to the show. We go back to handle call, the function that is evaluated when you try to run the up to algorithm. From the outside, there is a general server call uh, with a tuple, again, not a list, a tuple, with an atom up to and the number you want to count up to. So first, we want to validate that the number is a number, and if not, throw an error. And here, I'm using the and also trick because I still don't want else-less ifs. So there you go. If it's not a number, and also throw a error, not a number. But if it's a number, it will move through and uh, count up to whatever number. So compiling the module, starting the server, counting up to 25. And since the server is, al is already started and did die, we can try with uh, some other parameter. For instance, not the number. And so we should see the message uh, printed out saying that it's not the number. Well, actually, no, because as it says there, the function uh, fizzbuzz terminate is undefined. It's not defined. So if the function is not defined, we need to define it. So we go back to the code and we actually define the function. This is the function that is evaluated when the server terminates. And since we have a reason, we can you know, print out the reason for the termination of the server. So we compile the code, uh, we start the server, we count up to not the number, and the server terminated with a reason, it evaluated the terminate function, fine. But then there was this bad return value, error not number, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And we actually wanted to return just error not number so we can print the message. Um, but if this is one of those tricky things that happen in Erlang, that is that when you think you're throwing an exception, you're not actually throwing an exception. You're doing something slightly different that I will go into in a second. But basically, this is the, this is the key here. What you are doing when throwing an exception is actually providing an early result. So if you do, instead of return uh, error, not number, you provide something that, is, that looks like the expected result of the function, it will actually return that thing. Let's see. We compile, we start, we count up to not a number, and there you go. We get the, the error printed out. And even more, the server didn't terminate because it didn't crash. So we can still count up to a number. Very nice. So let me digress a little bit about this particular topic, which is handling errors in Erlang. And this is something that I've been meaning to write a blog post about. And I've been having conversations with uh, many Erlang folks, like long time Erlang folks, uh, Robert Bearding, uh, Simon Thompson and multiple others. So, so this is the this is part of the why Erlang is usually so strange for for people. Part of the reason. There are many others. But this is part. So in Erlang, an error is what you will think of an error: a runtime error, like dividing by zero, 
or if you want to raise an error in your function, you do error and it raises an error. Nothing particularly funky here. What you would think of throw in other languages when you want to throw an exception, the general idiom for Erlang is for the function to return something along the lines of uh, error reason, a tuple. So if, you're, if you have expected bad results, you don't throw something, you return error so that on the other side, if they don't want to deal with the errors, they can just pattern match with OK, and it doesn't match, so it crashes. But if they want to deal with it, they do a case. And there are tools to validate that if the function returns an error, possibly returns an error. And if you're, you're not uh, contemplating that situation, it will give you a warning. So fine. But this trips people because throw actually exists in Erlang. But it doesn't, it's, it's not supposed to be used to throw exceptions. When you, the, the reasonable way of using throw, I will tell you in a second, but there is another scenario because Erlang has two phases. If you can talk about sequential Erlang, but you can also talk about con concurrent Erlang. And concurrent Erlang, you have to decide if your process should die. Not only return a problem, like in form of a problem, but you also die. So if the result is really bad, you want to crash your process not the virtual machine, mind you, just the process evaluating the function where you're at. And that's uh, done with exit, not throw. Again, you don't throw an exception to kill a process. You exit the process. And that provides an exit signal and many other things. But then there is another thing. What happens when you want to return from a function before finishing the evaluation of it? That's when you use throw. Throw was created for non-local return and um, and the easiest way i can show you and it's not very easy but more or less is say you want to you have a function to uh, double every number in the list you want to traverse the list but if something is not a number you want to throw an error like raise an error in this case return an error so you have two ways of implementing this you can do this where the anonymous function validates for each element that it is a number. And if it's not, it return, it uh, evaluates to not number. You will end up with a list containing multiple uh, not numbers in between for everything that is not a number. So then you check if not number is a member of the result. And if it is, then you error. But if the list is arbitrarily long, and the first element is already not a number, uh, you will waste a lot of time traversing all the, all the elements in the list. So if you don't want to waste that and you want to just stop the looping in the, in the middle of it, as soon as you find uh, something that's not a number, you implement the thing like this. This will throw, uh, will, will do like a return from within the anonymous function to the first catch that's right above it in the call stack. In this case, the one at the bottom, throw not number, so you can return uh, an error properly from it. That's the way it was meant to be, but they poorly chosen the word throw for this return statement and confused the hell out of every single developer, Erlang developer after the implementation of this thing. All right, and finally, let's go back to uh, where we started. Remember, it has to be a script. It didn't need. It, it could be you can write a module, but it actually the, the expected result was a script, and Erlang provides a way for writing scripts called eScript. And for as in any other language, there is a main function, a point of entry in the script, and it's similar to every every other language. So you can, if there are no arguments, IO format. Uh, this is a way of using this tool, whatever. But if there is an argument that this one, um, we start the server and make it print up to that number. We go to the shell, we don't need to compile anymore. We run it, it tells us you're missing the number. We run it with the number. And of course it tells us that this is not a number. 
like this is a string we are in the shell the, the shell doesn't know that we are talking numbers here All right cool so we have to convert the thing so we go back to our code and just turn the list into an integer easy pc so we go back to the shell run it with 25 prints out the expected result everybody's happy now we run it with something that it's not an integer and we expect it, expect to see not the number not the number as we see all before but no we have an exception error of course because list to integer provided some wacky string doesn't return an error wait i told you that the way of handling these things was returning an error well uh, sometimes it is different <laughs> sometimes uh, maybe not so for this function it actually raises an error and so we have to try catch that error or use a function that actually returns an error as i described it before like this string to integer provided an input either returns the integer or it returns an error with the description whatever doesn't matter so if it's not an integer we leave it and so we, so we get the algorithm to return the, to print out the message that we want like this cool what are we missing here we're missing the last bullet in the list it should work for floating point numbers so for the sake of it let's try let's see what happens and of course what do you expect 25.0 is not an integer it won't work fair enough instead of converting to integers to integers we have to convert to float easy peasy we convert to float provide the input fair enough so this was 25 works perfectly this was not a number returns an error everybody's happy until you try this was 25 and you get not a number and right yeah 25 is not a float this is not a float this is an integer all right so what do we do we contemplate this situation and if it's not a float it might be an integer and if it's an integer cool so we go again to the console try with 25 try with 25.0 try with something that's not a number and yeah and for a final trick let me show you this you see two case statement case statements one inside the other i don't like that I want just one, in particular, this one. And I, I can tell you because brujo means sorcerer that this will work. And in fact, this actually works. How did I do it? Magic, of course. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Bruce. Really appreciated your presentation. Really fun presentation to watch. And really also really, what do you call it? Educative <laughs> presentation. Totally, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. I had one first question. How come you started to, to collect these like oddities? Um, I think my first one was, um, which one? Oh, the one with the, with the server throwing an exception in the shell continuously. Mm. Mm. That that was that, that was super tricky to find, and uh, after I after I debugged the thing, and I, I did exactly what I showed you here. Like I added a catch, I added a try, I added another thing and another thing and another thing, and by the by the time I figured out what's what, what was going on, as usual, when you try when you spend a lot of time debugging a problem, it's usually very dumb. It was very dumb, and so so I, I wanted nobody else to uh, step on the same stone, you know to, to uh, fall with the same stone. Mm. And so I, I decided to publish it. Mm. But uh, as soon as I told my uh, colleagues there in uh, Inaka, I was working at the time, 
uh, everybody came with, oh, yes, I remember when I, whatever thing, I, I tried to, to convert an integer to float and end up writing my own function and whatnot. <laughs> and so, so I saw, like, I, I, I always wanted to, to write a blog, but I never had uh, any materials to it. I didn't want to start, you know, with one article and then wait a year for the next mm. one. So I collected like 10 or 20 of these and I, I started writing them down. And at some point it became just, uh, it was just easier. So mm. every, every people came to me telling me, hey, I found this other thing. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I had a field of material. Yep. Thanks. Uh, have you found some of this in production code also? Everyone, every single one of them. <laughs> okay. Those are all from real life. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Amazing. I had one. Yeah, and then, then I had one more question. How did you find the what the f uh, foundation? I, I have a taekwondo practice in France. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> because if you Google it, you're not going to find it, I see. No, 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 that, exactly. <laughs> they, they, at, at some point, uh, they, they actually speak Spanish, so they didn't understand the, the connotations of, uh, of the um, acronym. Yeah. So they showed me, hey, look, they admitted me in the WDF, and I was, what? <laughs> Where? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, then I have people in the chat asking, "How do you did? The, how did you do the last thing? How did you get a flow to work like that? Oh, no, <coughs> the no, magic, magic stuff. <laughs> okay, it's magic. You have to figure out yourself. Everyone, look at the yep. code. Start thinking. <laughs> uh, I can tell you one thing. The yep. trick is the oldest trick in the book for mm. Erlang. Oh, okay. The original one for everything else." Thank you very much again, Brucio, for coming to us today. Uh, thanks for your presentation. I don't have any further questions, so thank you very much. Thank you. It was yeah. a pleasure. Yeah, really nice having you. Thanks. thanks. Uh, yes, and with that, uh, I would like to thank both our presenters, uh, Leonardo and Brucio, for coming to us today. And I also would like to thank the audience for coming to us today. Uh, before we go, uh, I have one thing more, two things to, s to say. Uh, we will have uh, the next meetup will be on the 10th or on the 15th of November. It's uh, the 10th meetup of the year and it will be on the 15th of November. Uh, then we're also planning for a meetup in December, the last of the year. Um, last slide before we go. If you want to present at a meetup, uh, just reach out to me in whatever channel you th you like I'm on most social media and or you reach out on YouTube or you reach out on the meetup app if you want to sponsor a meetup please just reach out to me again uh, if you're missing something we if, if you think we should contact someone put someone on stage ping me and I can poach them and try to convince them to come and, and present for us um, if you think you're m we are missing a topic, we haven't covered something for a while, or if you really want to know more about something and we haven't covered it yet, again, please feel free to contact me or comment in the Meetup app or just contact me directly. With that said, again, thanks everyone for watching. And again, thank you very much to our presenters for taking your time and sharing. With that said, have a nice evening, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>